Hi everyone, I am Zandi Wong. I am currently a freshman at Hopkins and I'm really excited to give my talk today. It's titled The Science of Sound, so let's get started. So if anyone asks me if there's any good part to having hearing loss, I jokingly tell them, well, I share a room with my twin sister, Hana, and sometimes she snores a lot. So whenever I need a good night's sleep, I can, I can just smush my right side into the pillow and it works instant earplugs every time because my left side doesn't have much hearing. And I'm always guaranteed a good night's sleep. But besides that though, growing up with hearing loss was an isolating experience. I have severe hearing loss in my left ear from oval window atresia, which basically means that one of the bones in the middle ear, the oval window, is deformed. So the sound never quite makes it to the cochlea and up to the auditory nerve to be processed as sound. About 90% of the hearing um, in my left ear is gone. And for a long time, I couldn't hear the birds rustling or the wind rustling behind my ears. And I wear a cochlear Baja implant bone anchor hearing aid implant to help remedy some of this hearing. Now, according to the National Institute of Communication Disorders and Deafness, about two to three out of every 1,000 children in the U.S. are born with hearing loss every year. And that's statistically actually a pretty high number, but growing up in a large high school, it was often lonely. I remember being one of five students with hearing loss out of a school of maybe 3,000 students. And I never actually met any of the, all of the kids that had hearing loss because disability and hearing loss wasn't really something we talked about at Hayfield. So I didn't want to be known as the girl with disability. I didn't want to be the outlier. So I defined myself in other ways. I learned to play the piano and I played tennis. I did a lot of community service and everything was going just fine. I just chummed along, went along my day and I didn't really discuss disability. I kind of shied away from it if people asked me about it. And it was going just fine until I heard the silence of sound, which was something I hadn't really heard since getting pulled out for speech therapy classes in elementary school. So what is the silence of sound? It's an oxymoron in a sense. I'm sure many of you have heard the silence of sound. There appears laughs coiling in the air like lacerating your confidence, heightening the tension of a rope that's about to snap. Without uttering a word, a whole group ostracizes you for what makes you different. Now, the last time I had heard the sounds of sound in high school was in a place that I had found comfort, even community in, my National Honor Society. This one time, 30 NHS students laughed at me because I mistakenly replied to a conversation about lunches with an inquiry about cell phones. I have trouble hearing in very noisy places because there's so much noise going on. And instead of asking for clarification, they laughed at me and encouraged their friends to laugh along without ever telling me what was so funny. And afterwards they told me, we're not laughing at you, we're laughing at what you said. And Although they spoke the truth, they aren't disabled. They don't understand what it's like being the odd one out after you've tried every day to conform to the norm. And what also makes the sound of silence sound so potent at that time is that it came from people I trusted and admired. You expect maybe six-year-olds to not really understand the meaning of what can hurt, but you, can, you definitely expect 16-year-olds to have a more wider understanding of their actions and how their words can hurt someone. We often talk about insults and words as bullying and harassment. Those you can easily define. You can perceive the meaning and the intent behind them and determine that they're hurtful. But with laughter, that is different. Laughter has so many definitions. Laughter can be reaction, reacting to joyous news. Laughter can be reacting to what is so funny. Laughter can be the writing what is ugly in this world, what is not perfect in nature and ripping it to pieces like scraps of bread. 
And disability has many definitions as well, both good and bad, and kind of like laughter as well. And after hearing the sun sound for the last time, I had to come to a reckoning to what I define as disability and how that plays into my identity and my identity in the greater context of my school and my community and wider society. And I had to come to a reckoning to find closure because I knew that just not talking about it anymore wasn't going to do me any good. And so I started thinking and thinking and thinking about sharing my story. And I'll share later why I decided to share my story. But when thinking about how I was going to share my story and what is the context of my disability, I came yeah. to three conclusions that I should clear up first. One, my experience is certainly not unique as a hard appearing person. Two, I do not know ASL, nor am I deaf. I cannot represent the deaf community. I certainly have had my struggles with hearing loss, but I do not know what it's like to have my whole world go silent. And three, my experience is not representative of the whole community of people with disabilities. I'm lucky enough that my family is able to afford the cochlear Baja implant and the many doctor's appointments associated with it. And my experience certainly has not been the most traumatic or even the worst. It certainly has been an experience. So then, why me and why now? Why would I even be standing on a stage telling you my story and giving a TED talk about it if I acknowledge that it's not the most traumatic, or even the most unique? And people ask me, Zandy, aren't you just being too sensitive? So what, a bunch of kids laughed at you? Just move on and go on with your life. And I have not really moved on. I have found closure with it, but Somewhere out there, someone, maybe not you, maybe not me right now, is getting laughed at because of things that they can't control, because of they are different from the norm. And I don't want to see anyone hurt because they can't be themselves. And so that's really why I'm here to share my story. If we don't acknowledge these little things, the signs of sound, the things that are hard to define, then nobody will know and nothing will change. The signs of sound will continue to reverberate. So I started thinking and started sharing my story regionally and that's some pretty cool podcast. And it's been a really refreshing experience to see everyone's um, responses and just growth of awareness of what makes us unique. And I eventually did find closure and I eventually did try to talk to the people that had laughed at me. And I'm not really sure if it worked in changing their mind, that's okay. I eventually somehow forgave them. And in sharing my story, I learned a lot about myself and a lot in finding closure and confidence in myself. And also learned some ways about how to reframe disability, which is kind of what I want to introduce you guys to today. So let's get on to that part. So first off, there are negative assumptions about disability. The most common example that you see of someone with hearing loss is probably your elderly grandma or your elderly mom calling you on the phone. And she's like, what, can you repeat that again? like that and it's really loud and it's kind of annoying sometimes and you just laugh it off. Um, it is the stereotype that people that are older are probably the only ones that have hearing loss, but there are many, many people out there with hearing loss. So when you're doing that, please don't just laugh it off. Please take the time to listen because so everyone deserves a chance to be heard and everyone deserves a chance to get their words out there. And then a negative, another negative assumption about disability is sometimes people see it as a compliment when people tell me, oh, Zandy, you've accomplished so much. You overcame your disability. When I reframe it, I like to say, I overcame the circumstances, my disability. I didn't overcome my disability. I still have hearing loss. Disability is something that sticks with you for life, whether you're born with it or whether you acquire it later down the road. It's not something that I can just rip off like a worn out Band-Aid. And so, and so there, I may never have my hearing restored and I, there may never be the technologies available in my life to time to restore my hearing. And that's okay. Instead, I overcame the circumstances of what people boxed me into. And what are these boxes that people put you into? These are negative stereotypes that perpetuate in the wider community, in the able community. 
and they are less prevalent than they are than than what was in the past, but they are still relevant for now. They are spread by the people who don't like when something's different. They are spread by the people who choose to not listen, even though they fully can. They are spread by the people who see us as just our condition and not as people. And it's often hard to hear that. Um, most people are very accepting when I tell them about my hearing loss, but some people, they kind of shrink away. And it's definitely an uncomfortable feeling. But by discounting out people because they have a disability negates their effort, they work to live in a able world. They work just as hard, if not harder than probably you guys do to live in, normally in an able world. Sure, I may not have heard everything you said. I may make mistakes in communicating with you, but it's not like I didn't make an effort to try. And then also something else I want to reframe about disability is that people with disabilities aren't deprived of life, we've simply adjusted. We may not be able to enjoy or do everything that an able person would. Like for example, I don't really like rock concerts, but I substitute that with different music. And that's okay, we just make the best with what we have. And then the last thing I want to reframe about disabilities is that people are not defined by their disabilities, they are defined by the actions that they take in context of their disabilities. Disabilities are always going to be a big part of my life, uh, whether that's including my, influencing my daily actions or what I study at school, it certainly will linger for as long as I live. But I make the best of what I can. I still continue to teach kids in mass, even though sometimes I can't hear them because by working, by putting in workarounds. And I just try to see the best in the situation, keep going with it. And then I've been lucky enough to be a student at Hopkins and have done some amazing research uh, with the School of Medicine. And I've been looking at it back in the context of my disability. Sometimes I do wonder, did they choose me just because I have hearing loss? Did they choose me just to have that diversity factor? And sometimes it haunts me. It makes me really wonder if I deserve this spot. And after telling my story and talking to more people with hearing loss and with disabilities, I realized that this wasn't the case. They chose me, whoever chose me, they chose me because of the actions I took in context of dealing with my hearing loss and the circumstances that people boxed me into. They chose me not despite my disability, but in context, my disability. My hearing loss does not define me. I would never wish for someone to have hearing loss. I would never wish for someone not to be able to hear the birds chirping or the wind rustling behind their ears. I would never wish for someone not to have the words to communicate their thoughts and actions. But I wouldn't change my experience growing up as a teen with hearing loss. Because of my hearing loss, I'm more caring and aware. I take the time to listen because I know what it's like not to be heard. I never take anything for granted and have accomplished a lot because I know it takes a lot to tell the world that you are different without succumbing to its expectations. I've been lucky enough to continue sharing my story regionally and on some pretty cool um, podcasts and it's really nice to hear people's feedback and just increase awareness. I hope it helps. And at Hopkins, I've been lucky enough to find a community of people with hearing loss, whether that be faculty or students just like me. And it's comforting to know that I am not alone. And I still want to be known as the girl who improvs piano music, binge watches Brooklyn Nine-Nine, and is always up for eating cream puffs, but I don't shy away from the topic of disability like I used to before. If people ask me, I tell them about my disability instead of deflecting. I tell them the truth, all of it. And I don't shy away from telling people why their fallacies and assumptions are hurtful. My experience is certainly not the most unique, nor is it the first one or last one to come but it's relevant for understanding why what's left unspoken, the science of sound, 
somehow reverberates the loudest. I continue to share my story to encourage acceptance of what makes us unique, nothing more, nothing less. In the spirit of this TEDx event's theme of growth, by finding closure with my identity as a teen with disabilities and learning to reframe my definitions and perceptions of disability, I've grown much more aware. Aware of the consequences our words and actions can have on individuals. Aware that what's left unspoken somehow hurts still. Aware that learning to reframe and redefine what we believe is true can encourage personal growth. And aware that being heard and being recognized can temporarily silence the silence of sound, finally allowing the birds to be heard at last. Thank you.